Hi, I'm Luke O'Neill and I'm Professor of Immunology in Trinity College Dublin and I'm here to try and answer all your questions because I bet you've loads of them and maybe your mum and dad can't answer them so I'm going to do my best to answer some of the questions you've brought up. So Charlie, who's five from the North Strand, wants to know when did this develop? And that's a great question, Charlie. Where did this virus come from? You know, now it's a brand new virus. Uh, it arose in December. That's the first time scientists in China saw it. And we know it began in China. And the Chinese doctors there began to see some sick people turning up in hospitals. They had lung problems. They couldn't breathe. And these doctors wondered, what is this? And then within the space of a few weeks, they found it was being caused by a new virus. They could detect this virus in the people's lungs. And of course, viruses are tiny little things. They infect our bodies and they make us feel sick. And this is a new virus that was, uh, that was discovered. And then they, want, they wondered where exactly it came from. And guess where it came from? Bats. It turns out this virus was living in a bat. And for some reason, then it got from a bat into a human. We're not quite sure how that happened, but it began in bats and then it infected humans. So that's the answer to where this virus came from. So Ruben, who's eight from Velcamp, is wondering about the bat question, I guess. And he wants to know, you know, how, how did it jump from bats into humans? And we don't really we know. I mean, one idea would be a live bat in a market because it was a market in China where they were selling these bats. May have just coughed on someone, you know, and then the person picked it up that way. It could have been in bat poo. Of course, we love poo, don't we? Uh, that's the other possible source of it, I guess. It's unlikely it was people eating bats. We feel that's less likely, but certainly it began in the bat and then jumped into the human. Sasha, hi, Sasha from Hope. She is wondering, uh, why is it called a coronavirus? Now, this is a really good question, of course. So once we were able to see the virus with a microscope, now viruses are tiny, tiny things. I mean, to give you an idea, 500 million of them would fit on the end of the dot at the end of a sentence. That's how tiny they are. So you need a very powerful microscope to see them. It's called an electron microscope is the fancy name. Very powerful microscope. And microscopes make things bigger, you know. And then once we could see it, it had these strange spikes around it. And the spikes look a bit like the sun. You know, if you draw a picture of the sun and it's yellow and you put little lines out of the sun, that is what this virus looks like. It looks just like the sun. And the word corona means crown because the bits all around the outside look a bit like a crown and a king's head as these spikes coming out of it. So the word coronavirus comes from the fact that it has these spikes that make it look a bit like a, a, a crown. Ashling, who's born in Paris, Ashling has a really great question. She's wondering why does this virus make people sick? And of course, that's the big question we'd all like to know the answer to. So what happens is it goes inside your body and you normally inhale it in through your nose or just in through your mouth or even in through your eyes. Can you believe this virus and get into your eyes? And then it's inside your body and it goes into your lungs and it's able to live in your lungs. It's got a special kind of way to get stuck in the lungs. And then once it's in your lungs, um, of course, your body tries to fight it. And we have this thing called the immune system, which is what I work on. And the immune system is all these white blood cells in your blood. They're very good at fighting germs. They're very powerful cells. And they try to kill this virus then and they make you better. And it turns out that four out of five people fight the virus and get better. And they've no symptoms hardly because it just their body is very good at fighting it. Sadly, around about 15%, so maybe, you know, one person in five roughly, they get sick. And the reason they get sick is because for some reason their bodies can't fight the virus. And the virus gets a foothold, it begins to multiply inside your body. And that multiplication, all these different viruses are there now, they're all making copies of themselves. They begin to damage your lungs and then you can't breathe properly. The second thing they do is they give you a high temperature. And that's actually your immune system trying to raise the temperature in your body. Because if your body's slightly warmer, your immune system works a bit faster, it's strange. And so therefore the body temperature goes up a little bit as well. That's another symptom of this thing. And then finally, you might clear it, but sadly some people just get sicker and sicker. And they're getting sicker because they can't fight the virus. It can be because they're a bit old. Older people, like most things in people's bodies as you get older, things don't work quite so well. Old people aren't as strong as young people. It's the same with their immune systems. And sadly, the, the virus then begins to really kind of get a foothold inside the body and makes people even sicker, sadly. And then they end up, up in hospital. And of course, when they're in hospital, then the doctors put them on a special thing to help them breathe. They put a mask over them or even a tube into them and that helps them breathe because their lungs are not working properly. And of course, your lungs is where you breathe in and out of. So, they that, that in the hospital then that, that sort of pr procedure that, that way of doing things helps people breathe more easily and that saves people's lives and then very sadly some people get very sick and die and that's the really sad part of this and of course doctors are working very hard 
to stop people, those people dying from this illness. And there's great progress there, actually. And we're hopeful as time goes by, less people should die. So Arlo, who's nine from New Zealand, it's great to have a question from New Zealand, Arlo. Great. He's wondering how long does it take for the symptoms to start? And then how fast can it spread? And these, again, are great questions. So we know, because so many people have had it now, Arlo. I mean, I think it's something like 400,000 people is the total at the moment. And of course, doctors can look at those people and study them and ask them questions and figure out what happened to them, kind of, you know. And we now know that once you get infected, it takes about seven days before you begin to feel sick. So what that means is the virus is in your body, it's in your lungs, it's starting to make copies of itself and divide. Finally, that level of virus gets a bit higher, and now that begins to make you feel sick. So the first symptoms begin to appear about day six or day seven. Now, the good news is those symptoms mean your immune system is fighting the virus, by the way, because many of those symptoms are being caused by your own immune system getting going and beginning to fight the virus. And the symptoms last maybe three or four days, and then you get to day 14, so two weeks after the start of it, you begin to get better. And most people by day 14 are much better. And then by day 15, 16, 17, they're fully recovered and the virus has been killed by the immune system. So it's a really wonderful sort of thing. And as I say, four out of five people have that, that their immune systems are so effective, they get better after about two weeks or so. And then how fast can it spread? Uh, again, we've looked at that, scientists have measured that very closely. We know that a single person who's infected can spread it to a two people on average, two to three people on average. So one person means two or three people get infected next. And then you can imagine each of those people infect two and three more people. And now you can see how it begins to spread. And then because of that uh, sort of uh, rate of spread, it goes pretty fast. And you can get from a single person being infected up to tens of thousands of people after a few weeks. And that's why it's spreading through all these different countries because it's spreading from person to person. And of course, the best way to stop that then is to stop people meeting. Because in that way, then, you don't spread it to someone else. It's very simple. And that's why all the advice is to stay home. And even though that's very tough because you've got to stay home and you can't go to school and you can't go to play with your friends, if you have it by staying at home, you will not spread it to someone else. And that means your body can then fight it and get rid of the virus. And then it's stopped in its tracks. So that's a very successful way to stop this thing spreading. But we know it spreads quite fast unless we take those measures to keep people from connecting and being together. That's the real secret there, I guess. So Ryan, who's eight from Roscommon, is asking, how does it affect our lungs? And that's a great question, Ryan, because obviously that's a bit of a mystery. Why would this virus go and hide in your lungs? Other viruses don't live in the lungs. Some of them live in your skin. Some live in your brain even. You know, some live in your liver. So different viruses live in different parts of the body. This virus goes into your lungs. Now, we know exactly why that is. Now, if you can imagine the virus little ball, it's got these spikes coming out of it, right? Those spikes are a bit like a key for a lock. Imagine the spike is in the shape of a key. Now, where is the lock? The lock is in the lungs. So your lungs actually have the lock for that key. And that lock is a special protein on the surface of the lungs. And lo and behold, the key fits into the lock beautifully, opens the lock, and now the virus goes inside your lungs. And you only see the lock in the lungs you do see some lock in your, in your stomach as well, actually. We know that much. So sometimes people get like, stomach problems with this virus. And it's also in your heart. And in fact, the virus can damage the heart. They're the places where the lock is. So if the virus is in your body, it's searching for the lock. It's wandering around the body. And then finally, the key goes into the lock and then the, and the virus gets inside the cell. And this is very useful because what that means is if we stop that spike and things called antibodies, actually, that your body makes can, can cover that key. A bit like, you know, sticky stuff clogging up the key. That'll stop the key going in the lock and therefore the virus can't get inside the cells. And that's why the, the immune response works because it makes antibodies to stop the key going in the lock, which is a lot, you know, a fantastic advance really. And we're very happy to make that discovery. So that's the answer as to why it does actually affect your lungs. So Sean from Thurless has a whole load of questions. I reckon Sean must be an immunologist. You never know because he's got some great questions here and he's obviously very interested in the whole thing. So his first question is, can animals catch it? And the answer is no, so you won't spread it to, say, your pet if you have a dog or a cat. We do know it lives in bats, of course, by the way, so they can give it to us. And maybe we can give it back to them, you never know. But most animals, no, it doesn't seem to affect other animals so far. But obviously scientists are watching that closely just in case. 
Uh, but so far, we don't think it spreads from humans into, into animals. And then a second question is, um, can you get another illness at the same time? That's another great question. And sadly, the answer is yes, because if you have the virus, your body's a bit weaker because your body's trying to fight the virus. And that might make you more prone maybe to a bacteria. And you can get back bacteria, a different type of germ entirely. But our immune system is trying to fight those as well. So if the immune system is distracted into fighting the virus, there's a risk another germ gets in. And therefore, doctors keep a very close eye on that to see if other infections are there when you have this one too. So that's an important thing to think about if, you, if, you're, uh, if you're sick. And then the next question is, are there any countries where it hasn't spread to, I don't think so now. I think every single country in the world has cases of this virus. Uh, probably the last place is Antarctica, where very few people are anyway. You know, it hasn't reached that yet, I suppose. But every other country sadly has it. And that tells us how contagious it is. It just spreads. One person landing in an airport in some country will begin to spread the virus. And that's what's happened with this. It's all over the world. So it really is a world problem now. Every country, as we know, is affected by it. And then Sean wants to know, um, which country has the highest amount of people. The US of A has taken over. So China had by far and away the biggest number because it began there. Italy came up next where it was very common, but now it's the US. And of course, that's because there's so many people in the US and it's kind of a, the number of people in the country and then a certain percent will have the virus. So the US is now number one in terms of number of cases. I'm watching the, we're all watching the US very closely now, of course. And then the last question Sean has is, are there any foods you can eat to prevent it? Now there's good news here, Sean, because your best friend when it comes to this virus is your own immune system. It's in your body, all those white blood cells. They are able to fight this virus. And the four out of five people who get better, it's their immune systems that have killed this virus. So can we make our immune system work better? Absolutely we can. A good diet is very important. Your immune system is in your body. It likes nutritious food. It likes things like vegetables. You know, It likes certain vitamins, vitamin D for instance. It doesn't like fatty food. So try and lay off the fatty food. Try and have a healthy diet. Uh, secondly, if you can um, get a bit of exercise, because it turns out that the immune system can sometimes fall asleep a bit in your blood and get a bit sluggish, like sitting on the couch kind of thing. If you exercise, your blood flows much better around your body, and that churns up the immune system, and now it comes alive. And then it begins to do its job. It's fantastic because it can fight things. The third thing we always recommend is a good night's sleep. And again, immunologists, scientists have shown this. If you get a good night's sleep, your immune system is wide awake and much more active, just like other parts of you, I guess. So a good night's sleep is very important as well. And then the fourth thing that we always talk about is try and not worry too much. Because it turns out that if you worry, that causes the thing called stress and the immune system doesn't like to be stressed. And we know this. Often people who worry might get a cold more often, you know, because our immune systems don't like stress. So try and not to worry too much. And remember, the best way not to worry is to, 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 to be aware that there's all these scientists working for you. We're all trying to find new treatments to stop this virus. And there is success. And there's no doubt we're going to beat it. It may take time, but we're very confident that we're going to beat this virus. So try and not worry too much about it. And then your immune system will benefit as well. So they're the main ways in which you can use your own body now to fight this virus. So Rory and Amy are asking, how quickly will we find a cure and other Irish companies trying to do this? Well, first of all, we're absolutely optimistic that we will be able to find a cure. Now, what we mean by a cure can mean two different things. First of all, there's these things called vaccines. And you guys have had vaccines. Everybody's given a vaccine as a child. It's injected into you. And it protects you against things like measles, for instance, which is a horrible disease with all these spots. You can protect against measles with a vaccine. And a vaccine actually is a part of the germ and you inject that part into your body and it's only because it, because it's a part of the germ you don't actually get sick but your immune system can recognize that part of the germ and the beauty of this is that when the real germ comes along the immune system has remembered and can fight the germ and stop you getting sick a good analogy is it's a bit like um when the sheriff puts up all these wanted posters around town you know and then when the bad guy turns up he's recognized and killed. That's exactly what a vaccine does. It puts up all those wanted posters in your body. And now when the bad guy turns up, in this case, the virus, you can fight it, you see. So a vaccine is a great thing then. And vaccines are so important. They stop lots and lots of different nasty germs from killing us. And there's 40 different scientific groups all over the world are racing to find a vaccine. And we feel we'll have one. It takes time because it's got to be tested for safety and all kinds of things. So it will take about a year but there will be a vaccine, that's the first thing. The second type of cure that we have actually 
uh, will be available more, more quickly. And what this type of cure is, it's called an antiviral drug. It's a drug that directly kills the virus. And amazingly, scientists have one already. And they developed this drug. It was developed first for a different virus called Ebola, which worried people a few years ago. But it turns out this drug also kills this virus, in, at least in, in, in a test tube when you test it in the lab and in animals. And that's the first place you go. And now there's trials in humans to see if this antiviral drug can work in humans. This will be a cure because it'll kill the virus in your body. It's a chemical, a drug that you take that kills the virus and now the virus is dead. So we're very hopeful that that cure will now emerge. And again, loads of labs are trying to do that. And the last thing to mention would be if you get a nasty it's a lung, if, you know, if your lungs are damaged and so on. Um, we even way, we've got ways now of slowing down that damage. And what these drugs do is they kind of put the fire out in your lungs. It's almost like your lungs are on fire when this virus is there. And you can dampen down that fire with these drugs as well. There's at least four drugs being tested at the moment to put the fire out in your lungs and then you can breathe again, you know. So there's big hope because of all this effort that's going on all over the world. And this includes in Ireland. There's a company called Regeneron in Limerick who've got a fantastically powerful drug to protect the lungs from getting injured. And they're doing trials, for example. There's also lots of smaller Irish companies developing ways to test things in your body to see if you have the virus. And, and that's a really important thing as well because you want to test people you know, to make sure they have the disease or not. And then you might be able to show where the disease might go next if you can do those various tests. And then there's labs in the universities doing various experiments and testing ways to treat the virus. So the Irish scientists are joining in the international effort to try to crack this. And again, we're, we're hopefully playing our part. And one of these labs somewhere in the world, maybe more than one, will crack this. And it's a bit like you're taking a shot at a goalpost. The more shots you take, one might get into the goal. You know, It's a bit like that. And the more shots on goal you have, the greater the chance is that we actually will develop a way to stop this virus. And there's massive hope that this will be the case. So many, many thanks everybody uh, for sending in those really good questions. They were very, very good. I found them very interesting and I hope I've managed to answer them. And of course, I'm always happy to answer questions anytime. That's my job. So don't hesitate to reach out again and all the very best.